Hi there, welcome along to On The Whistle. I'm your host, Zane Nabi, and today I'm recording this podcast from my brother and sister-in-law's basement in Chicago. Chicago is a very special place to me because it's where my wife and her family are from. And it is also the place where I started to devise and hatch the plan for the On The Whistle podcast. So it's very special to be here and to be recording it in the basement, which to some is unglamorous, but to me is super fun. Um, And in today's podcast, we have... Mike McCobb, Africa's super agent, appearing on our show. Now, last week, Courtney spoke to um, Benedict Villacazi, the former Orlando Pirates captain and Bafana Bafana player, about his career, his highs and his lows. And in that podcast, Benedict spoke about a failed move to Denmark and also how he didn't believe he earned his potential while at Orlando Pirates, levering leveling a number of allegations against Mike. So it's only right that we give Mike the right of reply to give his version of events. And Mike has done this on the podcast today. So without further ado, we're going to tee up this interview with Mike. We encourage you to listen. And if you haven't listened to the um, Benedict Villacazi podcast, just go have a listen. It was the week before. And then tune into this one as Mike gives a very different version to events and to how things played out. Do take a listen now and enjoy. Now, our interview with Benedict Villacazi certainly merits some follow-up. And joining me now to give his perspective on things is his former agent, Mike McCobb. Mike, thanks for being so accessible and joining us on the pod today. Welcome. Thank you very much. And it's, it's wonderful to see you again, Zayn, and uh, to see your progress um, in the industry. So well done. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, Mike, um, just for some context uh, with Benedict, how long did you work with Benedict and represent him as his agent? It was probably a, close to a decade that we were together. So we, we spent a lot of time together as, uh, as you know, I don't even like to, to use the word agent, as somebody that uh, advised him in his, in his career. Now, Mike, there have been incredible highs and lows in Benedict's career. In 2005, he had a rape trial. Um, he had been accused of raping a 15-year-old girl. It must be stated yes. for the record that he was found innocent of both rape and statutory rape Correct. in a South African court. But for background, Mike, you were a close confidant of his. What was it like working with him through the highs and the lows? You know, the, the crazy thing is that we worked with him through, through the highs mainly. Um, We looked after probably the most lethal 9-10 pairing in South African football at the time, and that was Leslie Magnatella, the late Leslie Magnatella, um, and Benedict Villacazi, who I still believe is one of the most exciting number 10s ever to grace uh, a football field in South Africa, and a wonderful person as well. And I need to make it clear right from the start that all I'm here to do is to set the record straight, and in no way does does it change the way I feel about Benedict. Always admired him as a, as a footballer and a wonderful person. And all of the dealings that I had with Benedict, um, right up until the time that he decided he no longer needed to be represented by an agent or by an agency, um, we had an incredible relationship. Mike, Benedict had been linked with moves to Europe, the first of which was yes. to Sweden. Why did that move fail in the end? <laughs> I just think that, you know, whenever you, a football player that plays for a big football club, and Benedict played for Orlando Pirates, um, and when you talk about big football clubs, we talk about them worldwide, um, money is never the issue to them. Success is more important than, than money. Although there, there does come a time where you can't say no to um, a potential transfer if, if, you know, if the transfer fee is really, really good and you believe it's the right time for the player to move on. But in this particular instance, um, the deal wasn't right for Benedict. And um, we couldn't, you know, we couldn't come to an agreement between club and Orlando Pirates, club and Benedict. And so that, uh, that fell by the wayside. But probably f- for a good reason, because sometime later, Sibonga Numveti had done so well at Alborg and had uh, won the league championship with him. Um, we then recommended to the then sports director, Lunga Jakobsen, um, the next best player we believed to come out of South Africa at the time, and that was Benedict Villacazi. They were looking for a 10. 
and um, the deal was done. So they paid a transfer fee to Orlando Pirates. Um, we negotiated Benedict's personal terms, which, which were good and um, good for a first move. And Benedict moved to, to Denmark. So Benedict goes to Denmark. There are obviously high expectations yes. of this move. Um, Very much so. According to Benedict, he has a number of family bereavements, challenges back in South Africa, um, and he wants to return. In our podcast, he explains to my co-host, Courtney Fries, that he spoke with club chairman Ivan Kors at Orlando Pirates, his son and Pumi, also key figures like Floyd Mbele and Screamer Shabalala, um, asking to come back. He says the club through their various representatives, said they would come back to him, but never did. Um, do you have any recollection of him contacting Orlando Pirates or of, or of him wanting to go back in 2008? Um, what, what is your memory of, of him wanting to come back and why things didn't work out in Denmark? So it is true that he had certain family problems. Um, we have a very strong office in, in Gauteng in Johannesburg. And we offered to assist Benedict with all the issues that, that um, were going on at that time in his life. But I, I do believe that Benedict never really settled in Denmark. That's my honest belief. Um, I felt he was, he was homesick and for many reasons. And we don't have to go into those reasons. But I felt he was homesick. And he never quite reached the heights that we expected him to reach. I thought that he would set the world alight in Denmark because Numveti had done. And I, and, I, and I truly thought that the combination between Numveti and, and Vanakazi, particularly two South Africans, would, would really be um, positive for, for Aalborg. Never turned out that way. And at the end of it all, it was Benedict's request to come back to South Africa. And don't forget that he had hardly spent a season at Aalborg. So it wasn't as if he had spent a number of seasons at the club and had done exceptionally well for them and then had these family problems which forced him to come back. It was, it was a case that he never quite settled in Denmark. He never quite set the footballing scene alight in Denmark for Albo, for whatever reason. And that, that was compounded by the fact that at the time he was also experiencing certain problems at home. Um, he wanted to return. He spoke with me. I was never aware of the fact that he had contacted the club Orlando Pirates directly. But I can tell you what our modus operandi has been and will be um, going forward is that whenever we, we take a player from a club in South Africa and move him into Europe, when that player moves back to South Africa, particularly if it's, if it's a big football club, we always, if the player is, is, is willing to do so, we always offer the services um, of the player to the club that he played for in South Africa. So in this case, it was Orlando Pirates. I personally contacted the chairman, Dr. Irvin Causa. I also spoke to Screamer Shabalala on one or two occasions. And when I spoke with Benedict, and this is the absolute truth, at the same time, and you know, the football grapevine is, is alarmingly short when, uh, when news like this hits the, um, the media. Immediately, Mamelodi Sundowns heard that Benedict Villacazi was keen to come back to South Africa. They approached me as well, and they said they would like to make Benedict an offer. My um, commitment to any of our clients is, is to make them aware of all offers that are available for them. I told Benedict, because we had spoken about me speaking to Orlando Pirates, I told him that I'd spoken to Orlando Pirates, that Mamelodi Sundowns had engaged with me, and his words to me were very simple. He said, Mike, I'm not getting any younger. If Mamelody Sundowns, if their offer is substantially more than Orlando Pirates, I want to go to Sundowns. I conveyed that to Orlando Pirates. And Screamer, in actual fact, came back to me, um, if I'm not mistaken. And I mean, this was some time ago, but if my memory serves me well, Screamer came back to me and said, listen, we're very disappointed. And the, and the chairman was upset with me, quite understandably, because Benedict was, was basically came through the ranks at Orlando Pirates. And the reason why I said to Benedict, that should be our first port of call, because I believe that that would have given him longevity in his career. You go back, you play for the club that, that raised you, you do well for them, and somewhere along the line, you will, if you want to stay in the football industry, 
there will be a home for you. Um, and Benedict was adamant that he wanted to, to move to a club that offered him the best financial package. Um, as it turned out, Sundowns offered um, a better financial package and Benedict elected to join Mamelodi Sundowns. Uh, there has never been an instance, not once in my 23 years in this, in this industry, where I have made a decision for a player and forced the player to, to follow my decision. We advise, we, we guide, we, we show the pros and cons to the player of, of a deal or numerous deals on the table, and ultimately it's up to them to make the final decision. Benedict's decision was to return to Sundowns. Or Mike, to return thank, to South Africa and play for Sundowns. Sure, and Mike, thank you for that context and, and giving us all that information. Yeah. Uh, when you hear what Benedict has said about wanting the move back to South Africa, are you, how surprised are you um, by some of the things that, that he has said? I'm, I'm surprised by two things he said. I'm surprised by, by the fact that he believes I never um, did enough to bring him back to Orlando Pirates. And that's not the truth, because if you, if you had spoken to anybody at Pirates, they would have told you they were my first port of call. Benedict made it absolutely clear that he wanted to play for the team that could offer him the best financial package. As I said, he said, I'm not getting any younger. I have a family to support. It's important for me. And there's very little more that you can do as, as an advisor than to say, well, you need to look at the longevity of your career. You need to look at where you've come from. But if you believe that financial package is the most important thing, I have to support you and, and, and it wasn't as if he was going to a football club that wasn't a serious football club. We all know Sundowns, even at that stage, were, were very professional and very competitive. So that was his choice. Um, the second thing that surprised me was when he said that he had spoken to certain players at Albon and the players said to him that your agent should have told you that the club was prepared to relocate your family and the club was prepared to give you a far better deal um, to keep you in Denmark. The truth of the matter, that was never the case. Um, Benedict, I think, had only played a handful of games, five games for all. And there was absolutely no way that the club was prepared to even consider um, an improved contract and relocating his family because they weren't quite sure um, if Benedict was going to settle in and, and improve at the club. And, and honestly, when, when I approached Lunga Jakobsen and told him about Benedict wanting to go back to South Africa because of serious family problems. Lunga was very disappointed. They paid a transfer fee for, for him. And he said, well, you know, on what basis can you give him his clearance? And that's exactly what we did for, for Benedict. We managed to secure his clearance from Olborg and get him back to South Africa, which, which is what he wanted to do. So, you know, there was absolutely no truth in the fact that Olborg wanted to keep him, wanted to extend and, and improve his contract and relocate his family. Sure. Uh, Mike, I was going to say, for our listeners out there who might not be aware, Benedict has said that he met a few of his ex Allberg teammates in 2010, about three years after he left the club. And it was at the 2010 World Cup where they had asked him if he was aware that the owner at the time in the club had wanted him to stay, had wanted to bring his family over from South Africa, had offered him an improved contract, uh, accommodation, and support around the dependents who'd come over. You say that deal was never presented to you. You say that, in fact, it's, it's not true. No. And in actual fact, when I um, contacted the sports director, who was no longer the sports director at Albu, but at the time when um, Benedict was there, he was the, the guy that I dealt with for Numbeti and Benedict. And I, and, and I said to him in confidence, this is what has been, has been told. Now, I knew nothing of it. So please, uh, you know, Lunga, if you, can, if you can at least enlighten me and tell me if I've missed out on something here. And he said, Mike, absolutely. He said Benedict had played a handful of games. And he hadn't really impressed at the club. And there was absolutely no way that they would have made an offer to improve his contract, relocate his family, um, to keep him in Denmark. That was the answer that was given to me by the man who signed Siobhan Gunnumberti and signed Benedict Villacazi. 
again, Mike, thank you for the context and, and giving your perspective. Yeah. The, the, the final sort of strand on, on this story is yes. the fact that Benedict says he called you and he explained this to you in 2010. Yes. Do you recall that conversation? And he says, since then, you guys haven't spoken. Is, is that correct? Absolute nonsense. Absolute nonsense. I've never, ever spoken to Benedict about that. Ever. The first I heard about it was through a football publication in South Africa. And then they contacted me. And, and exactly what I'm telling you, I told them. And it's surprising that so many years later, um, you know, the same, I think it's two years later, the same thing has come up again. I feel sad for Benedict because I don't think he fulfilled his potential as a footballer. And, and you know, um, he never took my advice. Um, I was surprised when he, you know, when he elected to, to look after himself because we had formed a very close bond. And Mike, for the listeners out there, what year is it approximately yes. he decided to look after himself and where did his career go? Well, I, I think he had been, I think he had one more year left at Sundowns. So I'm not sure of the actual year, but I think he had one year left of his three-year contract. Something like that. And, you know, it's a long time ago. Um, and from there, he decided, I think he left Mamelody Sundowns and joined Black Aces, if I'm not mistaken. And then I think he went across to Black Leopards um, and he wasn't happy there. And um, that's, that was really the beginning of the end of a really exciting career for Benedict because um, from there onwards, um, he played in a couple of other African countries, but at a lower level. And as I said, never quite fulfilled the potential that we all believe that, uh, that Benedict was capable of, of achieving. And again, I'm going to say this to you because it's important. I love the guy. I still love him. He was a, a wonderful character, a wonderful footballer. That's why it truly saddens me when I have to listen to stuff like this that I know is not true and I categorically state is not true. I, wouldn't, I, would, I can never understand why he would say things like that. And, you know, if the players had told him that, then he should have approached me and said, hey, Mike, can you clarify this? And I would have said to him, why don't we get on a call with Lunga Jakobsen, who was the then sports director, and let's clear the air because nobody ever approached me on that, Benedict. But he never spoke to me about it. It only came out through, and that was years later, um, through a publication um, in a South African football um, magazine or paper. Mike, to move away from his move to, uh, yes. to, to Denmark, um, something else he brings yeah. up in the interview, and I know you understand the South African football ecosystem yes. intimately yourself coached at Orlando yes. Pirates he said that in 2007 yes. he was earning 10,000 rand a month for context that's probably more than uh, probably less rather than teachers and journalists would have earned in the country and given Orlando Pirates as one of the biggest teams in South Africa and on the continent and probably in the world that 10,000 rand a month figure seems really low. Do you have any insight on, on the accuracy of, of what his wages would have been at that time? No, I, I honestly uh, cannot say that, that I have that insight and that I can remember what he earned. Um, all I do know is that in those years in South African football, footballers never earned massive amounts of money. Don't forget that the Premier Soccer League has only been um, in existence, I think, since 19... I'll tell you now, because I coached Pirates in 94, 95. I think the Premier Soccer League was, was birthed in 96 or 97. Um, and it was only from that point onwards that there was really um, a substantial hike in, in the earnings of players in South African football. And so if you said to me, you know, what were the other players earning at Pirates? Can I remember? Not really. Um, also, don't forget, Benedict came through the ranks at Orlando Pirates. And it's, it's always, it always seems to be the case that when players come through the ranks at a football club, they sometimes earn less than players that are bought, um, bought in from other football clubs. It just seems that that's, and it's not only Orlando Pirates, it seems as if that's, that was the norm. In, in those days. 
um, and still probably exists to a certain extent today. But, but one thing I can tell you is that um, in those days, in those years, football contracts weren't large at all. Okay, so it's not beyond the realms of possibility that that's what he might have no, been doing at not, the time. No, it's no, not. No, not at all. Not at all. During our podcast, Benedict also spoke extensively of players preparing for life after football. When you were working with yes. him, how were you trying to aid him during that transition? I appreciate you weren't representing him during his yes. final years, but um, how did you do that with him? And how do you do that with your, your current players? I'll tell you how we do it with players in general. Okay, so, so within our organization, we have access to tax consultation, investment consultation. We assist with acquisition of property, um, application of bonds, or for bonds. Um, we give advice on, on wills, prenuptial contracts, and a whole host of things. The sad reality is that only a handful of players, even to this day, only a handful of players access the services that we offer. And I wouldn't say amazingly, it's not coincidental that those players that, that have taken that advice, not only in the field of football, because we represent rugby players and cricketers and, and swimmers and whatever, um, those players have set themselves up, or those um, sports men and women have set themselves up for a, a good life off the sport. And don't forget, it's not only financial, because, um, you know, these players are used to the limelight. They, they, they adored, particularly in, in football in, in South Africa, they adored by, by an incredibly big fan base. And so they come to the end of their career and all of a sudden that adoration disappears. I don't have to, to tell you how quickly fans forget that, that adoration disappears. How do you cope with that from a mental point of view? That's the one aspect. The other aspect is obviously the financial aspect because particularly in those days, players, and even today, um, players, if you, if you play your entire career in South Africa, even if you're at the, at, at the real top of, of, the, of the earnings list, um, you'd find it incredibly hard to retire at the age of 35, 36 years old. And then you're having a great career if you retire 35, 36. So it's vital that, that those players are prepared for, for a life after their, their career in, in, in playing the game. And, and so we aid and assist them in terms of, of their education, um, guiding them in that way. A guy like Bernard Parker, for example, um, we've, we've organized bursaries for him at Boston College. He's, he's qualified in sports management. I think he's doing sports psychology at the moment. Um, but you've got to wonder that desire's got to come from within. You know, it's impossible for me to sit with a client and say, right, we're not going to force you to invest. We're going to force you to buy property. We're going to force you not to buy a fancy car, not to buy a, a, a fancy suit, um, not to be seen in the fancy places. We can't force those things. We can advise and we can guide. And we're trying to do it even more so now with our younger generation. Say to them, guys, your career doesn't last forever. And so what's important is how, how you behave in your crop, in, 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 um, honing your craft. It's not about a good lifestyle and about working hard at training. It's about sacrificing your life in that short period of time to your craft. And part of that is your preparation for when you retire. And so we, we officially have what we call a one-on-one -on -one interview with all our players at least twice a year, where we, we sit down and we take notes on a template as to where they are with their investments, where they are with their tax. Do, do you need any assistance um, with certain, you know, certain parts of your investments, et cetera, et cetera. The point is that unless they're honest and open and they're willing to share that part of their, of their life with you, it's very difficult to force them to do anything. Mike, again, that's fantastic insight. And it's probably worth a podcast on itself, yeah. preparing players for after football. So it is. Um, it is. There might be an opportunity to get you on one of our panels when we put that together. But um, thank you for being so generous with your time. My final Absolutely. question to you, Mike, is if you were to 
bump into Benedict or pick up the phone and speak to him, what would you say to him? I'd say, first and foremost, my love for him is still the same as it's ever been. And that's the truth. Benedict had a very special place in my heart, um, as did most of the players that I personally dealt with. Because as you know, Pro Sport has a number of agents that work within our, our corridors and I get to, to, to work with only a handful of players, particularly today, um, on a one-on-one -on -one level. But that's the first thing I would say to him. The second thing I would say to him is I'm really disappointed um, as, you know, as to what you said. Um, let's sit down and talk about it. And, and let's clear the air because life is far too short to hold these feelings within. I have absolutely no bitterness or grudge towards Benedict or any person that has had, you know, I can't please everybody. Um, I cannot be liked by everybody. Um, I do my best for, for all of our clients. We do our best for all of our clients, but we're bound to disappoint certain of them. Their expectations may not be met. Sometimes they're not realistic. At other times, I would say maybe we haven't done our job properly, but no, there would be absolutely no hard feelings between myself and me. Mike, thank you for our time. Um, we Pleasure. wish you well. And for our listeners out there, if thank you're you. listening to this podcast, feel free to get in touch with us on this subject. You can uh, find us on Twitter and Instagram at OTW underscore yeah. podcast, on Facebook, on The Whistle Podcast, and on YouTube, where some of you might be viewing this interview on The Whistle Podcast. Mike, once again, thank you for being so generous with your time. We wish you well, and um, we hope to hear from you soon again. Absolutely, and to your listeners, um, have a wonderful and safe festive season and happy and prosperous new year.